Hello, this is Tom from Marshall Tactical Defense, training for real life situations and threats. Um, today we're going to talk about building a church security team and I'm actually a, a, the head of safety for my local church and I want to give you guys some tips when you're building your program to help you along the way. Uh, I put a countless hours in working with a team of people uh, from law enforcement to uh, legal staff um, and some other selected individuals uh, to put our program together and I, hopefully this will be a benefit to you and your organization. Um, just to give you a little background about myself, um, I used to teach uh, Aikido, um, some different martial arts styles, I have now I have my own school. I have formal law enforcement training um, and also worked as a bouncer at one point for a little while at a, uh, at a club. So I have some real life experience working with people in a security uh, fashion. So um, those that that one is very suitable to um, the, this line of work. Uh, so the first one, one of the most important things we have to do is have a congruence on why we need to set up a team. Uh, we have a duty to defend and protect our loved ones and those entrusted to us. Um, in the Bible, actually, in the Old Testament, it talks about. Um, when you can take a life and when you can't in regards to self-defense. And unfortunately, in, in today's uh, culture, um, there's, it, it's not seen as being very Christian to defend yourself. Um, we're supposed to lay down our, our weapons and be nonviolent, but that's, that's clearly a misunderstanding um, of the Christian principles. So um, out of prudence, we need to do that. And we have a responsibility if, if for pastors protecting the, their prisoners in congregation, that, that's a pretty serious um, responsibility. So we want to do it right in, in a legal uh, manner. Um, number two is the police. Uh, what I highly recommend, uh, not everybody has big budgets, they can afford a team of police officers. Um, at least hiring one person, uh, one on-duty officer, um, it would be preferred only because they have the highest level of authority. Um, so basically they can respond in a serious situation that allows the team to be an eyes and ears team and basically just be the eyes and ears of the police officer. That will limit you from potentially um, getting in some legal uh, trouble or being in a lawsuit, that type of thing. Um, it's just prudent to have that if you can afford it. Um, number three is know your self-defense law. Uh, this is crucial. When I set the art program up, uh, we talked to, to Texas Self-Defense Law, which I use for gun insurance. They have an on-duty uh, legal staff you can call with your membership uh, anytime, talk to a program attorney, um, and it's all free. So these lawyers specialize in self-defense law, so a very valuable resource you can use. And as well as when you have a police officer on duty, you can talk to them. They're there working. It's very hard to get advice if you call the police department straight away versus when they're there on your shift. So they've been a tremendous resource for us, bouncing questions off and, and being a partner as well as setting up the team. So um, definitely some uh, great aids for you um, as you go about that process. You also have to know, um, very, very important, and you, again, uh, I live and work in Texas, so I'm familiar with this Texas self-defense law, but you need to check your own state's laws regarding this fashion. Um, in Texas, in September 2017, they passed a law that allows volunteer security teams to carry firearms as long as you have a valid license. Um, before, you couldn't carry any weapons if you're serving in a security capacity um, that was not paid and you didn't have proper licensing. So uh, it's a great move um, for Texas, uh, but you have to check your own state's laws, which you can and can't do. Um, Administration, um, the, with all the, the recent uh, attacks we've had with terrorists and whatnot, there's, there's definitely a movement to, for people to see the need to create have a team. So, um, but one of the hard part is you might have some individuals that have some training, but don't feel comfortable leading a group or being an administrator. They may not lack those certain management skills, but may have um, street experience. So. Uh, but there's different ways you can structure the team. And what I found is, is, is using the talents of the team. So if you have somebody that's maybe a good manager, but may not necessarily feel comfortable serving 
on duty every Sunday, but he could also manage the team and be a part of the team as well, even though he's not working for. So, um, or it could be somebody that's not even a part of the team, that's another part of church staff that will resume safety responsibility. So there's different ways you can set it up. Um, don't feel like you have to have one person be in charge of the administration, the, the training and the tactical side of it. So um, do what best fits your organization and the skills and the talents you have. Um, it's also good, uh, what I've found is, is you want to try to decentralize as much as you can because you, you don't want to get burned out, uh, especially if it's just a volunteer position um, and as far as the team. So um, you want to have, look for the team members and see what kind of skill sets they have. Uh, we have one guy that's great with uh, you know, the internet and the website, so he manages and runs our website. Um, other people do their video, you know, guys are helping me out today, taking the video, he's offering his talents in this capacity. So using the, the gifts and the experiences of individual members to, to donate their time, you can run a very successful program at little to no cost. So get the guys involved. Number five is protocols, and this is one of the most important things I can emphasize to you guys is you have to have a, a legally and very clear and specific guidance on how you handle situations. This is what's going to keep you guys out of trouble and from getting sued. So we have established guidelines that we, we have, every member gets it, church staff, and also the group leaders of the parish that are not serve on the team so they can have some guidance and, and in case something happens they have some framework to, to work upon. Uh, there's another video that we did um, called the Ten Commandments of Security video. I would highly recommend watching that one. It goes more into detail uh, about the protocol and, and how you handle uh, volatile situations. Uh, but as far as you get some written guidelines, uh, you want to document as much as you can because uh, that way you've communicated that you've offered proper training and protocols to the team. In the event that something unfortunate does happen, it will help you in the court of law. So um, it, it's very important. Um, and you can probably go online and, and the Department of Homeland Security has some stuff with, for an active shooter. You can kind of make a hodgepodge of different resources and, when you're crafting your own. But you also want to have something specific to your program as well in your church uh, and addressing the protocols. And you want to make sure that the pastor is compliant on that uh, and, and understands and fully supports uh, the initiatives and what you're doing. Um, the other thing is, if you have any kind of legal reference, or if you have anybody that's an attorney in the, in the church, they can review that to make sure you're not saying something that um, could get you in trouble. Number six is recruitment. Um, we have over about 50 guys in our, in our church, and we have a small church. It's actually, I think, about 13% of the male population uh, of this community is actually a member of the team. So. Guys, it's a great opportunity for guys to help out and serve the church in a way that um, is kind of unique to them. Um, not everybody can sing, be in a choir, or be in a music program. So it's a nice way for guys to get together and also have some camaraderie. Um, so we, it's been very, very fruitful and also uh, getting you know, people together. Um, when, you, when you're putting your life on the line, it's, it's uh, pretty serious stuff and, and you can really force some good, strong relationships, which is very important, uh, especially for men these days. Uh, so, and if you, a lot of these, if you have a big church, even and it's even easier because you should have a number of uh, active and or retired law enforcement personnel and military uh, uh, veterans. So, uh, it's a great resource you have. You already have the talent, you have the training there, you know, the expertise. It just makes putting a program really easy if you can get them involved. And I would recommend reaching out to them first uh, to participate on the team. Um, we, of course, you don't have that at this church, but through a lot of training, um, I've seen a very successful program where most of the people do not have prior security experience. Um, we haven't had one issue. We've been uh, in place for about a year and a half, so as long as you have proper training and you recruit the right people, uh, you can have a very successful program. One of the things that you do want to look for is the personality. You want somebody that can maintain calm under stress, and I also want somebody with an anger issue because you can have a very volatile situation and somebody can act outside the step of the law um, in an aggressive manner and cause some legal issues. So you want somebody that's courteous, um, that has a lot of confidence, because um, it's going to be some tough situations you have to deal with. Uh, you need to be able to speak very fast on your feet and 
react to certain situations that are very dynamic. So basically, you, you want somebody that um, has confidence, uh, can control their emotions, and can think, perform and think well under stress. Those are the, the key elements that I look for when, when having a member. Number seven, communication. Um, there's, I would say there's probably three levels or circles of communication you want to address. The first one is obviously with your team, your, your uh, direct reports. It's very important you have quick and effective communication. We utilize a uh, texting, which is a very popular form today. Emails, we have restricted email that's just for the team members and church personnel that they can see because you're passing confidential information if you're dealing with um, threats. So it's very important that you have that secure and, and restricted access. Um, so that's very important. We also have a website where we can post our schedule, uh, training videos like this one, and we also have a page for threats uh, that we can have. So, and if there's any protocol issue, we have all our documents on there. It's very, very effective um, if you can get somebody to help you with that. The next layer is the church community. So that, so basically, you want to, a lot of our intel that we found actually comes from the, the congregation. Basically, they're there when, even when we're not there. So they see a lot of things going on, suspicious activity. So you really want to get them involved in the security process and report anything that they see. We created a web uh, email that's uh, specific to our team that's issued to the whole parish and they can report any information uh, to the team and that, that's monitored. Um, so it's very important to get the parish active and the congregation active in the security process. They can provide a very amount of valuable uh, information. The third layer is the community. So once you get your program established, I would recommend reaching out to other churches in your area, um, even different denominations and faiths, because sometimes there's people that target churches uh, or different groups of people, like panhandlers, gypsies, different things that um, have kind of a unique instance. So I would recommend getting a, on a, some kind of communication, whether it's just email or it's a, a blog or something like that. You want to keep that restricted, but uh, it's highly recommended to share information. And you want to have partner with law enforcement. We have one of the local law enforcement um, sergeants who's in charge of criminal intelligence. Um, he monitors that so I can have a direct communication set up with him. If we have any suspicious activity and then if whatever they feel they can release to the general public, um, he can report information back to us. Very, very important. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going around. The more information you have, the better. Uh, we saw with 9-11 that when the different groups didn't communicate with each other, how it broke down. Um, but once you're all on the same team and working together, it's much more efficient and effective. Number eight is weapons. This is where you have to check your state self-defense law because some states will allow you to carry and some won't. Um, I recommend at least, uh, at a minimum, uh, pepper spray. It's non-lethal. Uh, I think it's legal in most states. Um, if you can, again, you have to get your, your uh, pastor's permission to be able to carry on site. Um, so you have to make sure that it's a little more delicate. You have to make sure that you have a proper licensing and whether your state law will allow you to carry a firearm and serving in a church security fashion. So it's very, very important. Um, but you do want to have, be able to be effective in your response. But if you have a, a police officer on duty, which we do, it makes it a lot easier because you're not waiting. You know, we have somebody there in less than a minute. So he should be able to have to use his weapons if possible. But if needed, then we can respond with force. It justified so um, very very important to know your state laws um, one thing you can do uh, if your pastor really feels is about having firearms on the property and they have the, the sign some signage posted it's different in most states so you have to research what signs um, are valid and which aren't but if, if he wants to keep the signs on that's fine he can allow certain selected individuals to carry on the property with the signs posted um, in Texas, in the state where I live, uh, it's up to the property owner's discretion whether he would press charges if somebody was caught illegally carrying on the property. So what I would recommend, if that is the case and you're granted special access uh, to carry, or the person to carry the firearm, that you get something in writing from the pastor directly for your own records. Um, last one is training. It's very, very important. Uh, we actually do um, quarterly, we'll be on site and actually do walkthrough scenarios. 
Um, but basically we'll have actors and we'll rehearse some the typical situations and threats that churches have to deal with. Um, it's been the most informative and eye-opening to the team members to see how hard it is when you don't know what's going to happen there's, and they don't know the script. So it, you, can, you can really see how an individual will react in a stressful situation. And then from that point you can go over your, your protocol and guidance to make sure we're all on the same pace as how we, how we handle those. So training is very, very important. Uh, utilize maybe some third party to get some hand-to-hand -hand training. And if you're gonna allow, if the pastor's gonna allow firearms on the property, then the guy should get some form of training of some sort. Um, but it is very, very important. Uh, last one is intelligence network. Uh, I touched on it a little bit with communication, but it's really, really important. Build, you can also leverage too, if, if you have a network of groups outside the church, uh, other churches, um, you can also share ideas in their programs and leverage off each other. Um, so it just it, it helps to build the best in class program as well as sharing information, meeting new people, it's just a great way. Um, in my school, we have a, have a self-defense school, also a martial tactical defense, and I open that up for other churches and security teams to train with us as well. So um, it's just, it's a great thing to do, um, but really work on building that intelligence network, that communication line, so we can help protect our fellow uh, Christians. Uh, that's about all we have today, so I hope this was beneficial to you. Um, Check out some of our other videos. Uh, there should be a little bit more in detail as far as once you establish the program, how to fine tune it and, and run it effectively. This is Tom from Marshall Tactical Defense. Thank you.